Well, grab your Bibles. Let's head to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Uh, while you're doing that, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Matt Darby. I get to be our lead campus pastor here for our Gilmer campus. Tell you a little bit about who we are. Uh, New Beginnings is one church, but we actually have three campuses. Right here in Gilmer, we have a campus in Longview, led by our lead pastor, Pastor Todd Connitz, who's my pastor. Uh, and we have our Spanish campus that also meets there in Longview. And so if you're a guest with us, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Uh, it just means the world to us that you would, it's hard to walk into a new church. I know that. So I'm thankful that you did it. Thanks for, and I hope you feel right at home today. Uh, if not, uh, please let me know. We would love to be sure uh, that your time on our campus was a blessing to you. And I hope you'll come back. Uh, you came on a great day. We're jumping into a new series today in the book of Second. Peter. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this book, a little bit about what we see um, as we navigate through. We're calling this series, The Last Words of a Dying Man. Peter is at the end of his life. He's in prison. He knows he is going to die. His death is near. And these are the last words that he has given. But listen, here's what I love. Even though Peter is dying, the words he speaks are filled with life, filled with life, filled with strength. For the believers, and so it's my joy to put to jump into this um, uh, season with you. Um, Peter knows his life is about to end. He says in verse fourteen of chapter one, he says, "I know that the putting off of my body will be soon." That's what he says. The putting off of my body will be soon. So, Second Peter for us is kind of a unique opportunity because. We're getting to kind of look into a farewell address, right? A benediction in Peter's life. And we're getting to see for this man who knows the words that I am writing, these words that I'm speaking to these believers will be the last words that I have the opportunity to give them. This is it. I won't have the opportunity to give them more after this. And so we get to peek in at to what mattered most to him. What was really pressing on his heart? for the believers. And so we get to look in at that. First and second Peter, we believe, are written really to the same group of believers. These were people who had been scattered uh, and churches that had been really scattered and were under pressure and, and persecution uh, throughout what for us would be modern day Turkey. That's the area uh, of the believers that are living there. And in first Peter, if you go back and read first Peter, what you find is Peter is addressing Christians who are struggling. They are suffering, and they're suffering because the Greco-Roman government around them and their Roman neighbors are persecuting the church. They're being harassed. They're, they're experiencing all this hostility. And the primary danger for them was this persecution coming from the outside in. That was the primary danger. We get to 2 Peter, and Peter's writing this same group of believers, but he's warning them about a different danger. In 2 Peter, he primarily deals with heresy, with false doctrine and false teachers. That's the, that's the emphasis of 2 Peter. There were false teachers who had come into the church um, who were teaching that um, God is not the ultimate authority. They rejected the ultimate authority of God. False teachers who rejected the return of Christ. They just simply denied that Jesus was going to come back. These were false teachers who rejected that there would be judgment at the end of time. And so when they said God's not the ultimate authority, Christ is not actually going to return and there is no judgment at the end of time, they naturally began to teach, then there really is no reason to act righteously. There's no such thing as acting righteously, and you can just let your desires and your passions lead you through this life. Now take that and, and, and hold it up against our culture and ask yourself, are we in a culture that is becoming convinced Christ isn't going to return? There's no real judgment at the end of this. God's not my ultimate authority, which means there's no real reason in acting righteously, and I can just let my passions and my desires guide me through this life. Right? This is not a new problem, right? It's not a new problem. And so no longer is Peter most concerned with this persecution coming from the outside in. 
he's now having to address a poison that's spreading from the inside out. That's what he's having to do. He's got teachers that are coming in who are compromising the truth of God's word and watering down the standard of God's kingdom is what he's dealing with. And the church is suffering because of it. And listen, anytime suffering rises in the church, it is often because of cultural hostility toward the truth of God's word. I think most of the suffering the church experiences today is the result of cultural hostility toward the truth of God's word. And when that hostility rises, when we experience that attack on the truth of God's word, when we experience that attack on the standard of God's kingdom, listen, if we as the church aren't grounded, if we aren't deeply rooted in our faith, deeply rooted in our doctrine, when that attack comes, we're going to become vulnerable to the manipulation of God's word in order to be culturally relevant. There is such pressure on the church in our nation to be culturally relevant And the way the culture says we remain relevant is we water down the gospel, we reduce the standard of God's kingdom, we allow for the manipulation of God's word so that we can remain relevant in the culture. And there are entire denominations that are falling to this, and the church is suffering because of it. And so you have churches that are willing to moralize they're, or excuse me, they're willing to compromise their morality. They'll compromise in sexuality. They're compromised in their conviction of the scripture. Why? To try and be relevant. Peter dealt with this in 64 AD. Here we are dealing with it in 2024 AD. And so Peter felt this urgency, right? This is his last word. To these believers, and there's this urgency to remind them of who they are in Christ, of what they've received in Jesus, and what matters most. How many of you have had the unique privilege of taking your kid to college or moving your kid to a new town and driving away and leaving them for the first time? Anybody felt that unique pain? Yep. I've done that twice in the last four or five years, and I want to tell you guys, those of you who had done it before me, just real quick, y'all forgot to tell me how bad that hurt. Y'all didn't tell me. You didn't warn me. It's painful, right? But it's this season of reminding. A lot of students are going back to college right now or going for the first. Anybody take your kid to college for the first time this year? Anybody do that for the first time? No? Okay, great. That illustration worked out exactly as I hoped it would. All right. (laughs) Um, But... When, I remember when we took our kids, we took our daughter four years later, our boys, our boys are sophomores now. I remember when we were kind of getting ready to go, I found myself giving them a bunch of reminders, right? I started reminding them of things. I started reminding them things like this. Um, don't forget why you're here. Don't forget why you're here. Don't forget who you are. Remember what matters most, Right? I would remind them of things like this. You can always, no matter what, come home. No matter what. You can always call me no matter where you are. I tell all of my children this. I don't care where you are or what you did to get there. If you call me, I'm coming to get you. No questions asked. We'll talk about it after, but I will come get you. I want you to remember, and I would say things like this. Remember your last name. Remember every room you go into, me and your mother go in with you, even if we aren't physically there. Represent it well. Remember who you belong to. You belong to Jesus Christ, right? There's all these. Remember to put on deodorant every day, please. So. <laughs> every day. And brush your teeth and put on deodorant every day until you're dead. Just do it every day. All these reminders. That's what Peter's doing. The entire book of 2 Peter is reminders. There's this benediction in Peter's life, and he's telling these believers who have been under persecution and are now dealing with false teachers, remember who you are. Remember who Christ is and what he's done. Remember what you have received in Jesus. So we're going to start in verse 1 
of 2 Peter. We're going to dial in to just verse 1 and 2 today, but I'm going to read through about verse 15 to give you the fuller context uh, to jump into the letter. Here we go. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. If you're there, let me hear you say the Bible is true. The Bible is true. Amen. If you're a guest with us, that's not just something we say. I want you to know you're in a room with people who believe every word in this book is true. We believe it. We believe it was written by the Holy Spirit who worked in men and carried them along. It's the divine inspired word of God. It is applicable to every situation in our life, authoritative over all of our life. It is God breathed. It is a living word and it is 100% true. That's what we believe about this, right? I just want you to feel me say that, right? Okay. Second Peter chapter one, Simeon Peter, don't let the Simeon throw you off. If your translation says that, that's just a different spelling and a pronunciation of Simon. Remember, Peter's original name was Simon. Jesus named him Peter, Petros, upon this rock, I will build my church. So Peter's identifying himself here. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us uh, His precious and very great promises. Why? So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a great promise that is. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an inheritance, or excuse me, an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. That's the heart that Peter, this whole letter is, is right there. I want you to be able to recall what matters most. And so he's telling these believers, you see it really in verses five through about nine, this idea of having faith that puts on virtue and knowledge and love and self-control, right? What's he saying in those verses? We're going to deal with those in a few weeks. He's saying, listen, a follower of Jesus must never stop growing up in Jesus. We must always be growing and maturing in Christ. But he begins in verse 1 and 2, by before he talks about the ongoing work of growing and being sanctified, and being spiritually mature. Before he talks about that, he shows us that beginning work began when we received salvation. It began in salvation, which is why Peter begins this letter reminding them of the faith that we have in Christ, reminding us of the essence of the gospel and what we have because of the righteousness of Jesus that's been imparted to us. And so what I want to show you from verse 1 and 2 are three reminders, three gospel reminders that Peter gives the church. Here's the first one. First reminder that in Jesus, every believer has an equal position before God. In Jesus, every believer has an equal position 
before God. I want you to notice how Peter addresses these believers. Now, one thing you have to know about this group of believers spread out through modern-day Turkey, they were almost all Gentile believers. These were Romans and Greeks and people in Asia Minor who had come to faith. Most of them were not Jews. They were Gentile believers. And notice how he addresses these Gentile believers in verse 1. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Now, that is an interesting phrase, a faith of equal standing, isn't it? Why do you think Peter wrote to these Gentile believers that their faith in Jesus gave them an equal standing with him and every other believer? Why do you think that would matter to them? It mattered to them because the Jewish believers would often make the Gentile believers feel like second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. The Jewish believers still believed they had the unique relationship with God. They got to know God and experience Him different than anybody than any non-Jew that came to faith. And so the Jews would be like, yeah, you can know Jesus, but not like we do. You can know God, you can have a relationship with God, but you don't get to know the intimacy and the favor that, that we have. And often these Gentile believers, because they didn't come from the history of all the Jewish customs and they weren't keeping those customs, were made to feel like second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. And so here's Peter saying, no, 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 this faith gives us equal standing. Gives us equals. How many of you have ever had the unique challenge <laughs> of working with the boss's kid? Anybody ever had that challenge, Right? You, the, the owner of the company, and all of a sudden you're working with their kid on your team. And I'm not saying this is not a blanket statement, right? If you're the boss's kid, chill out. I'm not talking trash about you. I'm just saying sometimes I've experienced that the boss's kid will sometimes think they've got a special, uh, they get some special freedoms, right? They get some special favors, special treatment. Rules don't necessarily apply to them. Why? Because they have a different history with the boss than you do. That's the approach Jewish believers took. We've got a different history with the boss. And Peter shouts that down and says, no, that's not it. When Peter talks about a faith of equal standing, he's making clear that the position of every true believer in Jesus is the same. Listen, the reason our position in Jesus is the same is because our condition before Jesus was the same. If you are in Christ, your condition was the exact same as every other person before they came to Christ. Here was our condition. Ready? Lost, enslaved orphans. That's who we were. Lost, enslaved orphans. That's who I was on my best day before Jesus. And everyone, um, every person, no matter what they've done or how they've lived, we have that in common. So why, how do we bring this into this room then? Peter's giving this encouragement to Gentile believers who were made to feel like second-class citizens. No, you have a faith of equal standing. I'm an apostle, and it's equal with mine. I want you to know that. Why would that matter? How do we bring it into this room? Right here. Listen, if you and I are not mindful of grace... If we are not mindful of our equal need for the grace and the mercy of God, if we are not mindful of the grace that was given to us, listen, we'll begin to classify one another's position before God based on something superficial and not faith. We'll start classifying it based on past experiences. Well, she did this in her past, so... I mean, I'm glad she's coming to church, but she's not like me. I didn't have all that. I didn't do all that. We'll start classifying on what we've decided is moral or immoral. What we've decided is religious or not religious, good or bad, right? And we'll, if we aren't mindful of grace, if we don't wake up every day and go apart from the grace of God, I am still lost, enslaved, orphan. That's still who I am, apart from something Jesus did for me. I'll start, and listen, any and every person who has believed in Jesus Christ for salvation has a faith of equal standing. Amen. A faith of equal standing. 
Because the ground is level where? Finish that for me. Where? At the foot of the cross. That's where the ground is level. So it doesn't matter if you've been a believer for five minutes and you have the most horrific past. Or you've been a believer for 50 years and you've lived squeaky clean. doesn't matter if you grew up in a home with deeply rooted faith or if you're the first believer in your family. Your ethnicity doesn't matter. Listen, this one will shake us a little bit. Your sin tendencies don't matter. This is where we, this, this, I got to camp for just a minute. This is where we get hung up. It's easy for us to look at that and go, yeah, we're all equal. Everything's equal. Jesus, we've all got received the same grace. We have the same faith, equal standing. Do you really believe that when you look at someone else's sin struggle that you've identified as more corrupt and worse than yours? What we've done in the church is we've identified a handful of sin struggles and we point at those and goes, because that exists in their life, there is, they get relegated to something else. My sin tendencies do not put my faith below anyone else's and neither do yours. We have a faith of equal standing. Equal standing. All right. So in Jesus, we have this equal position before God. But the next thing Peter wants them to see is what makes this position possible. What makes this position possible? Here's the next Reminder, the righteousness of Jesus makes our position before God possible. Look at ver the rest of verse 1. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God, of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The imputed righteousness of Jesus is what gives us our standing before God and apart from that, apart from the righteousness of Christ, a relationship with God is impossible. But the imputed righteousness of Christ may be the most gloriously beautiful reality in the gospel. It's unbelievable. The impute, right? The single most glorious reality in the gospel that the righteousness of Christ has been accredited to my life. That's a staggering reality to take hold of. What is the imputed righteousness? What does that mean? It's righteousness that has been credited to you or applied to you. This is called the doctrine of imputation, right? We all have things that have been imputed to us. Your sin nature, by the way, was imputed to you. It was given to you by Adam. You were born of man, which means you were born in sin. Adam sinned. Sin entered the world. We were born with a sin nature. So the sin of Adam has been imputed to us, right? That's why Paul says in Romans 3, all of us have sinned. Why? Because we're sinners. That's who we are. David said in Psalm 51, I was brought forth in iniquity. I came into this world, not because of something my mom and dad did, but because two sinners conceive a sinner. That's what happened. And so when I came into the world, I came into this world a sinner. Listen, I have certain genetic realities that are on me and a part of me. And nothing I can do about them, right? This nose right here that gets into the room before I do almost all the time, right? This is a family heirloom, this thing. Just handing this rascal down. This giant head I have that no hat fits on, this is my father's head. I would like to thank him for giving me this thing, right? I can't wear hats like you guys. You guys look great in a hat. I don't. Um, these devastating good looks, that's not my fault. <laughs> You're mad about it, but it's not on me. I couldn't do anything about it, right? It was imputed to me. Every per person is born under the imputed sinfulness of Adam. And listen, there's nothing we can do about that. The Bible teaches that the imputed sinfulness of Adam is not only on us, but it has a devastating effect. It causes us to be separated from God. The rest of Romans 3.23 not only says that all of us have sinned, but we have fallen short 
of the glory of God, which is Paul's way of saying we no longer meet God's righteous standard. There's a separation. Isaiah said in Isaiah, I believe it was 51 or 59, excuse me, that your sin has made a separation between you and your God. Meaning all of us fail to meet the righteous standard of God. Why? Because of what Adam gave us. Ready? Thank God the story doesn't end with what Adam gave you. The story ends with what Jesus gives you. Which is why at New Beginnings, we banner, we banner 2 Corinthians 5.21. That God made him to be sin who knew no sin. God turned Jesus into sin, not because he was, he wasn't at all and never had, and yet God turned him into sin so that in Jesus I might become the righteousness of God. That's the gospel. The gospel is that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, his righteousness, his perfection can be imputed to my life while my sin is imputed to him. Martin Luther calls this the glorious exchange. What was ours becomes Christ. What was Christ becomes ours. He gets my sin, I get his righteousness, and through that alone, I have right relationship and standing with God. And through nothing else, there's nothing else. There is nothing else that can cause you to be right with God apart from the righteousness of Jesus applied to your life. Nothing. This is why Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the way. I hear people all the time outside of the church and outside the faith say never Jesus. They love to say this. Jesus never claimed to be God or the only way to God. And I'm like, boy, that is a massive amount of ignorance. Holy cow. It's just a staggering lack of understanding of what Jesus said about himself. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And no one, not one single person, will get to the Father unless that person comes through me. That's it. And I know that this morning, I want to talk to the people for just a moment who are trying to figure out how to be right with God. You're searching. You're trying to figure this thing out. It's kind of why you're here this morning. You, you, you don't really know where things are with God. You know where you are. You know you don't necessarily like how your life is. You know there's things missing. You know things aren't what you want them to be. But you're not sure how to be right with God. I want you to hear me say this. The gospel is that Jesus came. Jesus was a real person. He came and he lived the same kind of life that you and I live. With every opportunity to sin. Hebrews said he was tempted in every way. Would you just consider that thought for a moment? Consider your worst temptations. I'm talking about that stuff that if somebody knew you were tempted by it, you would run away and hide and sell your house and move. The Bible says he was tempted in every way, as we are. Yet, yet, he was without sin. Which makes 2 Corinthians 5.21... That's what makes it so staggering and so glorious that God took this one who knew no sin and put him on the cross to die for sin, turned him into sin. Jesus didn't just die because I did it. God turned his son into my sin. That's the gospel. Because sin demands death. The wages of sin is death. But salvation is not only does sin deserve death, but God brings in a gift that we don't deserve. So the gospel is this. I don't get what I deserve, which is death, and I receive something I don't deserve, which is life through Jesus Christ. So I want you to hear me say this this morning. If if I'm talking to you right now, it seems unbelievable that someone would die for you that someone would see you at your worst and still go, I love you and I want you. That seemed, for someone in this room, that feels like something you actually can't believe. I can't believe that God would see me, see everything about me, 
and really want me. I'm telling you, the gospel is he does. And he sent his son to die for the very worst parts of who you are so that he could know you and have relationship with you and save you from your sin and give you a new life. Salvation is when the righteousness of Christ is accredited to me. It's applied to me and imparted to me. This is a reminder Peter's given them. Not only is he reminding them that in Jesus we have an equal position, but he's telling them it's the righteousness of Jesus that makes that position possible. Here's the last reminder he gives them. That the righteousness of Jesus produces, so this is now doing something, it produces an ever-increasing grace and peace. It's producing something. It's doing something. Look at, what, look at verse 2. May grace and peace be what? Say that word. Multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So what is grace? Grace is the unmerited, ongoing favor of God. The unmerited, meaning I don't deserve it, ongoing, meaning it does not come to an end, grace of God. That's, that's what grace is. It's just this unmerited favor of God. Peace is that state of rest, that state of calm that transcends our circumstances. And so here Peter is praying that both the favor of God, his grace, and the peace of God would be multiplied, would become an ever-increasing reality in the lives of these believers who are under persecution and dealing with false teaching and are suffering. And it is only through having a right position before God that is made possible by the imputed righteousness of Christ that you can have peace with God. Now I want you to notice the source of this grace and peace. Look at verse 2 again. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the what? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The grace and the peace of God cannot be attained apart from the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And when, Paul ta- when Peter talks about uh, the knowledge of God, this is not an intellectual knowledge, it's an experiential knowledge, right? It isn't, it's, it's not merely, it's not knowing facts about Jesus, it's knowing the person of Jesus. That's what he's talking about here. And if I want the grace and the peace of God, if I want the shalom of God to be an ever-increasing reality in my life, then my knowledge, my experiential intimacy, my nearness to God must also be an ever-increasing reality. You can measure the peace in your life by the standard of your nearness to God. And I want you to hear me say this. Your peace will never run deeper than your faith. It can't. My peace, I'm not going to live with peace that passes understanding if I'm not trusting the character of God and the promises of God and walking in relationship with God. I don't get the peace of God if I don't know the person of God, and I don't get the peace of God if I'm not walking with Him. My faith is never going to run deeper than my knowledge, my nearness, my intimacy with God, which is why when you look at this moment from Peter, remember where he is. He's in a prison in a Roman prison, and he will never get out. The next time Peter leaves this prison cell will be when they drag him out to crucify him in public upside down. That's the next time he leaves, and he knows it, and he knows it's near, and yet there's this peace. (laughs) There's this peace. And the peace is not because his circumstances are peaceful. They're not. They're anything but. There's peace because of the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ that he has. And so now there's this peace that passes understanding that has anchored him in this moment. Peter has walked with Jesus for 30 years now this point, probably 30 plus years, which means Jesus is not a subject he knew. Jesus was a friend he walked with. Do you feel the difference in those two things? And so as he's grown in the knowledge of Jesus, the grace and peace of Jesus has been multiplied 
in his life. James Shattuck said it this way. He said, in short, grace and peace can only be found and experienced when one knows God. And one can only know God in relationship with Jesus Christ. This beloved is at the heart of the gospel. So believer, listen, your peace will never exceed your faith. Knowing God, trusting his promises, resting in the finished work of Christ, ceasing your effort to try to be good enough and try to make yourself right with God and just resting in the cross and the imputed righteousness of Jesus. This is how we have peace that is not circumstantial. Okay. Several years ago, uh, when I first came to New Beginnings and was leading worship in Longview, I had a, a guy in my band by the name of Steve Tehan. Did anybody know Steve Tehan back in the day? Awesome. Steve was, uh, was a great guy. A great, I miss him all the time. Steve was an old honky-tonk guitarist. That's where he cut his teeth, playing in the honky-tonks, man. And he had played with just about every country music artist that had come through East Texas, Willie and Waylon and the boys. He had at some point been on stage with all of them. A really good guitar player. Loved to play with a slide all the time. Right? And um, Steve got cancer. And... He died several years ago, but in the last couple of days of his life, um, the entire band was in his room, standing around him. And Steve knew he was going to die. He knew it. As a matter of fact, he would die, I believe, about 36 or 48 hours from the moment that we had with him. He knew he was going to die. He knew the end was near. And so with all of his... <laughs> musician friends standing in the hospital room with him. He began to give us reminders. And I want to tell you, when I looked down at my friend as he laid on that hospital bed and I knew he was within the last few days of his life and he knew it, you know what I did? I didn't see a man that was scared. He wasn't scared. He wasn't worried. He wasn't upset. He wasn't fear filled with fear and doubt and regret. None of that was in, he was just at peace. He was at peace. Right? And then he went around the room one by one and he began to give us reminders. And I'll never forget that moment. He comes to me and he reminds me to be faithful to Jesus to lead his church well. And he reminded me to be a, a pastor that was worthy of being followed. I hope I am. And I remember, I've never forgotten it. Because in that peace, because there was the absence of worry and the absence of fear and the absence of regret and the absence of doubt, he was able to just rest in the finished work of Jesus, knowing he would be with the Lord very soon. And he was able to just build us up and encourage us. Right? That's what the peace of God produces. That's what it produces. And the peace of God is ours only through Jesus Christ. That's it. Okay. So now I need you to ask yourself this question. Do I have peace with God? Not, well, I think I'm okay. He's okay with me. I'm okay with him. I'm all right. Do you actually have peace with God? Right. Have you experienced the righteousness of Jesus being accredited to your life where you take his righteousness and he takes your sin. Has that happened? Right. Or are you trying to, to get right with God in your own way? I do really good things. I come to church. I'm a really good dad. I'm a great mom. I volunteer. I even serve. 
at this church, man, I give money. I do a lot. I'm a good neighbor. I'm a good worker. I do. My life is filled with being a really good person. Have you received the righteousness of Jesus? And has he taken your sin? If you're not sure, this whole room is going to stand up in about one minute. And when they do, and Philip begins to sing, some of our team's going to be just spread out across the front. You need to come out and you need to walk down. And listen to me, I think sometimes you don't come out and walk down because you're not sure what to say when you get down here. Great, I don't care if you know what to say. Just come down here and go, man, I'm not sure why I'm here. I just don't know where I stand with God. That's it. And we'll begin to walk toward him together. Believer, do you need to come and spend some time in prayer? Do you need more of the peace of God applied to your life? Are there areas you've been looking for peace and you just need to come confess that and be filled with the Spirit? So I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. And I'm wanting you to come down and let the righteousness of Jesus save you. Father, I pray that you would move. Holy Spirit, I pray you would fill this room. God, I know that right now there are men and women across this room who are trying to decide right now if they're going to get out. Holy Spirit, give them strength. Give them courage. Help them. We've seen the stories of life change. I just pray you would do it again. God, for the believers who need to be encouraged, help them get out. Come be prayed for. Come lay down their burdens. Come confess their sin. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's stand and you come.